You're listening to the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. This is Justin Gary. It's hard to believe that when I started recording this season of the Verbatim Word Podcast, social distancing was a brand new concept, and one that took quite a bit to get used to. But since then, we have been instructed to put space between us, to reduce our interactions to only those which are necessary, and to seek independence or isolation as much as possible, in an ironic effort to take care of one another, stay away for the benefit of others. Well, when I was a kid, social distancing was not the prescription for the day. The song, We Are The World, blasted from the radios, an anthem to unite and join hands to bring change to this world. That was followed up with an event called Hands Across America, It took place in 1986 when Americans, to raise funds for charity, held hands in an effort to make a human chain across the country. And for 15 minutes, about five or six million people attempted to do so, raising about $15 million towards the efforts to defeat hunger in in Africa. How times have changed. An event like that would not have gone far in 2020, unless, of course, a lot of hand sanitizer had been used on those hands across America, and six feet of separation had been guaranteed, and maybe we had taken shifts to meet up in groups of only 10 at a time as that human chain formed across the country. As we come to the end of this first season of Verbatim Word and our study in the book of Ephesians, Paul closes by emphasizing our need as Christians to be together not separate, to be united, not divided, and to be joined and not distanced. Last time we saw that we are in a battle under the threat of the attacks of the spiritual realm, attacks which are aimed at disrupting the work of God and discouraging and defeating Jesus' people and distracting the church from God's call upon its existence in this world. But Paul sought to encourage and embolden the faithful with a reminder that in Christ, we can stand against whatever comes our way, each of us clothed in the full armor of God that Jesus has provided for us. On this final episode of season one, we look at our need to be together, each of us individually standing our ground in the things of God while corporately strengthening and supporting one another. Let's take a look together in Ephesians chapter 6, picking up in verse 18. As we ended last time, Paul had called us to pray. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. As Paul had finished his list of all that is available to us in the spiritual war that we are engaged in, the call to stand aware of the enemy, in the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, standing firm in the gospel of peace, secure behind the shield of faith to deflect all the fiery darts that come our way, protected in the helmet of salvation and wielding the sword of the spirit, the word of God. He then challenged the believer to pray and pray and pray some more, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The call to pray was not just an attempt at self-preservation, though having a direct lifeline to God is important for each believer, and without it, we can't last long in this battle that we face. We were also challenged, though, to watch out for others in an attitude of prayer as well, to cover them as they engage in the challenges and threats upon their faith, supplication for all the saints. I have never been in the military or in combat, but I've watched a war movie or two. And in those intense moments, in the trenches, on the front lines, when the enemy is firing hard on the soldiers, the others are there to cover them as they seek to take ground or advance, aiming at the enemy on their behalf to give them room to move to a more strategic position or to take ground that is needed in the battle. One soldier yells, cover me, over the blasts of the artillery, and as he steps out to run to his next position, the others aim at the enemy to offer a window of protection for a few brief moments. And in the same way as we see in those battle scenes in the movies, Paul challenges the faithful to pray and be watchful, not just for ourselves, but for all the saints as well, by shielding, protecting, and covering our brothers and sisters in the faith, engaging in battle with them and and for them. 
It's something in verse 18 that Paul says we need to be watchful for, looking for opportunities, keeping our eyes peeled. Is there a believer struggling? Is there someone vulnerable? Is there one taking big steps of faith for the kingdom of God? Is there someone under attack? Be watchful. That is when we are to engage and to pray. Who's covering you in prayer? And who are you covering in prayer? If that is a hard question to answer, well, then we might need to reconsider our position. Paul himself knew how important this was to have others covering him in prayer. He went into hard situations all the time, the heat of the battle, and he knew that part of the key to his victories in the kingdom were that others were watchful and had his back. One way Paul got prayer coverage was simply to ask. We see that peppered throughout his letters, requests for the faithful to pray for him, or gathering with the saints to pray, often before entering new territory or going into the unknown or in difficult trials. Even Jesus in the garden, asking Peter, James, and John to keep watch, though they fell asleep when Jesus needed prayer coverage the most. We should watch for and ask for opportunities to cover others in prayer. I think something we don't hear enough in the body of Christ is, can I pray for you? I think we often say, I'll pray for you, which is good. But why wait? After church or among believers, can I pray for you like now is an essential phrase we should be hearing. It doesn't have to be long or eloquent. It doesn't have to involve heading to the front of the church to the prayer team or signing up to be on some prayer chain or prayer list. The body of believers should often ask, can I pray for you and do it right then and right there? offering prayer coverage in the intense battles of the Christian life. Paul did also mention, though, there, perseverance and supplication. That's bringing those requests time and time again, praying for the needs. And there's times where the Holy Spirit might prompt us to pray. We may not even know why. Someone might come to our minds. Someone might come to our hearts. Every now and then, I'll think about someone that I haven't thought about in 20, 30 years, maybe even someone from my childhood. And I, I wonder, why is that person even in my mind right now? There's nothing, no reason why I would think of them. And sometimes I wonder, is God just asking me to pray for them? The Holy Spirit will prompt us for supplication, to pray for those who might need it in that moment. And we're faithful to do so. Sometimes a great victory is just around the corner. And you know what? In our on-demand world, prayer seems to be more difficult to engage in, but it should be easier. How quickly we can reach out for prayer or reach out in prayer at a moment's notice to countless faithful who can intercede for us. We got to witness this recently, hanging out with someone when a text for a prayer came in. Someone was heading on a mission trip overseas, and at the last minute, a snag with their COVID test to travel. The prayer request was urgent because they were already en route to their international destination when they became aware that their test was not the right one. This meant that this person had to get a new COVID test to make the next flight to meet up with the missions team that was waiting with their next flight getting ready to depart. Now, traveling alone can be stressful in any way, shape, or form, especially adding COVID protocols to that. Traveling is even more stressful. So to add this inconvenience into the mix, well, to make the flight, this person had to leave the airport to go to a clinic some distance away that could administer the correct COVID test. And there was a small window of like 45 minutes to get back to the airport and for the test results to come in, which also could take up to 45 minutes. It was down to the wire. I mean, more intense than the final seconds of an episode of Chopped. And the text came in for the saints to pray, anywhere and everywhere to pray. And so we prayed. And others were as well, I'm sure, covering the situation in prayer. And I still don't know how. I haven't heard the whole story. But we did get the news that they made the flight. So while there are many distractions in an on-demand world to pray, there are lots of tools and opportunities to make prayer known if we just take advantage of them. It goes on in there, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Paul also mentions perseverance in praying for others. Because, well, God is a patient God and comes through in prayer in his timing. And while on our end, it may seem like a delay, on his end, it is the perfect time. So we need to persevere in our prayers, especially for others. Daniel was a man of prayer. And in Daniel 10, he has been praying and he is burdened. And he perseveres in prayer, seeking God and praying for his people. 
And as we see in the prolonged posture of prayer, one in which Daniel persevered, we read in Daniel 10, verses 10 through 13. Suddenly, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. The messenger reveals that the prayer was heard by Daniel, or from Daniel. Daniel's prayer was heard from day one, but that there was more going on behind the scenes, and in this case, a spiritual battle that was delaying the response. But Daniel had persevered, and the answer was now to be given. In an instant on-demand world, perseverance is increasingly missing, but perseverance is something that God's people can never grow faint in, especially when it comes to prayer. In Luke 18, the parable of the persistent widow, the passage begins with, Then he, Jesus, spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. That was the lesson that Jesus taught that day in that parable. First, that we always ought to pray with all kinds of prayers. And second, we should pray and not lose heart, not get discouraged or lose passion or focus or get distracted from it. Prayer should continue to be in the picture, no matter how patient we need to be for an answer to come. And while Paul himself was disciplined in praying for others, including the church in Ephesus, he had no qualms about asking for prayer as well for himself, as we see in verses 19 and 20. And for me, pray for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I love this. And for me, the Apostle Paul, with all his experience and knowledge and anointing, pray for me, he wrote, never growing distant from his awareness that he was completely dependent upon God. His prayer was that utterance may be given to him, that he might open his mouth and that he might have the boldness to say the things that need to be said. Now, if you think about this, Paul is in prison, in prison due to the attempt to silence him and an effort to quiet the testimony of Christ, which Paul was known for speaking. Paul prays, though, that utterance may be given to him. That means he's asking for prayer, for open doors, for opportunities to speak the things of God, even there while under house arrest, with limited opportunities to speak for Jesus compared to when he had been out and about from city to city beforehand. He asks for prayer, for opportunities to speak the name of Jesus, even in circumstances where he has been reprimanded for doing so and hindered from doing so. No matter where we are, there are people in need of Jesus in the gospel, but sometimes we get so into our routine or so blinded to those needs that we rarely find opportunities or at least perceive them to speak for God. But when we begin to pray that utterance may be given, no matter where we are, the Lord begins to move. Those opportunities begin to show up. At the end of the book of Acts, when Paul is in house arrest in Rome, and during which time he writes the book of Ephesians, we read, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Paul is in Rome, no longer free to roam, pun intended, with attempts to keep him from being able to spread the gospel. But he has asked for prayers that utterance may be given. And God answers by guiding him to rent a house, and people come to him, and he is preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. What an answer to prayer. When is the last time that you prayed that utterance may be given right where you are, in your current situation, in your present circumstances, in spite of the limitations placed upon you or the hindrances to doing so? Pray and ask for prayer, that utterance may be given. 
I'm also encouraged by the fact that Paul asks for prayer and expresses twice his desire that he may open his mouth boldly and to speak boldly as he ought to speak, he writes there. Even the eloquent, esteemed Apostle Paul, he prayed for open doors to speak, and he prayed for the words that might be spoken in those moments. He also prayed that he would be bold enough to take those opportunities when they did come. Believe it or not, the enemy does want to silence you, discourage you from speaking, because he knows the truth of God's word brings freedom, deliverance, salvation, healing, clarity, wisdom, and all other manners of blessing to those who hear it. So he tries to silence us from speaking it because he knows the power and effectiveness of God's word. How many of the prophets and greats in the Bible were fearful to speak or hesitated to speak? Those like Moses or Jeremiah in Exodus 4. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Jeremiah chapter 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I adorned you, ado ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Jeremiah, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faith faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set this, uh, this day set uh, you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. A powerful message placed there on the lips of Jeremiah. Jesus too told his disciples, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. It seems in an on-demand world that people have been emboldened to speak up, to share their thoughts, their views, their opinions, their insights. And social media has made it even easier to do so, hasn't it? Everyone with a platform to be heard on. And in that environment, there's a need for the church to pray that our voice will be heard as well. Where do you need to be praying for open doors and boldness? We don't need to worry about what to say, but we do need to pray. And Paul was wise and humble to ask for open doors and for boldness to speak when it was time. And that's another thing too, to pray for wisdom to know when to speak, when it will be effective and fruitful. According to scripture, there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak, and we need divine guidance to know when it's right. And the Proverbs tell us, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. Not every word spoken is a treasure or valued, but when God guides us to speak when it's fitting, it is priceless. Notice again how Paul identifies himself. He asked them to pray that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. An ambassador in chains. He wasn't going anywhere, at least not for the time being. An ambassador represents someone else. They are on the ground, a delegation that's been sent to represent one who can't be there. When I was on the mission field in Slovenia, there was a U.S. ambassador in the country, a consulate, an embassy that represented the United States in that country. And if I needed to take care of anything American, I went there. Whether it was a passport or other paperwork for all things regarding the U.S., we went to the ambassador. Where is your realm of ambassadorship? Who has God set, sent you to before to represent his son? Paul was in chains bound to be there, and God wants ambassadors in all places. And we may not always want to go there or choose to be there, so sometimes he needs to chain us there in a way, because otherwise we would try to get away. But he needs that witness there. And what a privilege we have to represent God as ambassadors. He takes us, ordinary believers, and places us in specific families and specific jobs and specific schools and neighborhoods and nations and even trials and tribulations to be his ambassadors to represent him there. 
David Guzik says in his commentary, we could imagine Paul asking for many things, such as relief from his imprisonment or for other comforts, but his heart and mind were fixed on his responsibility as an ambassador of the gospel. The ancient Greek word for chains mean, meant a prisoner's shackles, but it could also be used for the gold adornment worn around the neck and wrists of the wealthy and powerful. On special occasions, ambassadors wore such chains to show the riches, power, and dignity of the government they represented. Paul considers his prisoner's chains to actually be the glorious adornment of an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Whatever uniform Jesus asks you to wear in order to represent him, it's a glorious privilege to serve him right there, an ambassador of Christ. Now, bound in chains, Paul is not going anywhere soon. He is stuck in Rome for the time being, and in light of what he writes in verses 21 through 22, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Paul knows that this church in Ephesus is concerned about him. The last time they encountered Paul was a couple of years earlier, when he stopped nearby on his way to Jerusalem, that faithful trip where he would be arrested. And he had sent for the Ephesian elders to meet him on the beach as he journeyed to Jerusalem. He didn't want to go into town. He had too many relationships there. It would take him far too long. So he sent for the elders, and they met him just outside of town. And as they knelt on the beach to pray together, he had told them, and see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. And then he went on with this, And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. He knew it was coming. The prophecies had been said that when he got there, something horrible would take place, something difficult, something challenging. So he tells him, you're not going to see me again. This is our last meeting. And their response after he shared with them. And when he had said all these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, all those Ephesian elders. And then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. This group of Ephesian elders just blubbering and crying and snot-faced and all this stuff because their hearts were broken. They knew they would never see Paul again. They were concerned for Paul. It's years later. They followed his story. They know that he went to Jerusalem. They knew what took place. They know he got arrested. They know that he was in prison there in Caesarea for some time. Uh, they, they knew all this, and they were following his story, and they were concerned for Paul. Though they had not journeyed with him in person to Jerusalem where he was arrested, they had journeyed with him these last few years in heart and in prayer together with Paul. And Paul is aware of this. Though he is apart from them in Rome, he knows they are with him in spirit and probably very concerned for him. And though Paul has drafted this epistle to them, he can't get it all down on paper or parchment. So he sends Tychicus, a beloved and faithful minister of the Lord. Notice that. Paul sends this man to be able to communicate to them all of Paul's affairs and, and how Paul's doing because writing it out did not do it justice. He would make all things known to them, Tychicus would, because there was more to share. And he would be sent personally to deliver that news so that they could have a conversation and ask questions of him, direct to him, as to his face, and go deep. I think that there's some application here. In an on-demand world, we find it easy to share what's going on with us by posting it. How often do we hear, not sure if you saw it on social media, but I posted dot, dot, dot. Or if you find out something new about someone and, and they say, well, didn't you see that I posted about it? And it has become the new norm. Want to share something about yourself? Good news, life changes, challenges, requests for hope, help? Just post it and everyone will see it, right? And if you want to find out what's going on with someone, you just go online and find out what they've posted. There's something, though, about connecting with a person face to face, person to person. And when effort is made to connect, when there is some investment, Paul cared for the Ephesians. And he wrote the letter. It was his post, if you will. But there was so much more. And Paul wanted to honor that. He wanted to honor that relationship. He wanted to honor these people that had walked with him through so many things, through so many years. 
So he sent Tychicus because those conversations would mean so much more that they could hear it from him. There are things that we might share with the world that we might post, but there's an honor in sharing things directly with people that matter most and things that matter most with people that matter most. And Paul valued that authentic connection in the body of Christ. So while he posted this letter to Ephesus, he longed to go deeper with them and made the effort to communicate personally and intimately with them, even if it was through the mouth of Tychicus. So he sends Tychicus, a beloved and faithful minister of the Lord. Now, who is this guy? We read about him in Acts 20, verse 4. That's just after Paul's time that he spent in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. And it's just prior to meeting the Ephesian elders on the beach on his way to Jerusalem. He was a part of Paul's team and delegation when things got tough. And he was still sticking with Paul after the riot and after the arrest and after the years in prison before appealing to Caesar and even the ship and the shipwreck to Rome. Tychicus was still sticking by Paul's side through all of that. We read about him in Colossians 4, 7, with many of the same credentials, that he was beloved and faithful, a fellow servant, and that he would bring them news too, which makes sense since that other letter of the Colossians is also a letter Paul wrote from prison around the same time. So Tychicus was probably the delivery boy taking these letters to the churches. He's also mentioned in Titus 3.12, when Paul says he might send Tychicus to Titus in his place, in Paul's own place, a representative, an ambassador of Paul and an ambassador of Christ. We also read about him in 2 Timothy 4.12, Paul's last letter, where Paul says he sent Tychicus again to Ephesus. So years later, he would send him once again. What a guy. This man is beloved by Paul and by others. He's like family. That's something that occurs in the body of Christ, those close bonds. Tychicus is faithful, sticking around through the thick and the thin, through many seasons of life, most of them being quite hard. And he's a servant, serving Jesus and in turn serving Paul in the body of Christ. That's the kind of people we want around us in life, isn't it? Beloved people, faithful people, servants. We can't do it alone. We need to do it together with others. And Paul and Tychicus had invested in their relationship, time together, trials together, even travel together. And it's in those long-term commitments to others that great things happen. And this gets harder and harder to do in an on-demand world, especially when we're told to keep our distance in an era of COVID. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Do you want friends? Well, be friendly. Just start treating people as friends and you'll soon have friends. We need others around us. I love reading about King David's cabinet in 1 Chronicles 27, his state officials over things like the treasury and the properties and the military. Name upon name goes through those chapters and those lists. A bunch of people standing by David to run the kingdom. And at the end of that sea of names with all their roles and responsibilities, we read, and Hushai the archite was the king's companion. Amongst all those people, amongst the treasury, the properties, the military leaders, David had a companion and he made the list a friend because with all else that David had going on in his life and in his family and the kingdom, David was going to need a friend more often than not. Friendship takes sticking together, as we see in Proverbs 27 verse 10. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend, nor go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Keep your friends close. Being a faithful friend often means speaking the truth in love and being vulnerable. As Proverbs 27 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes we have to do or say things that may not please our friends at first, but later on, they'll understand why we did what we did in their best interest. And true friendships make us better, though it isn't always easy and light, as the proverb says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Investing in friendships is essential because as Solomon wrote, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Paul had those around him who, depend, who he depended upon. And when Paul couldn't do it, Tychicus could step in and say, hey, don't worry, I'll take care of that, Paul. Genuine care in the body of Christ. It's something that Christ does within us. Taking people who may not have a lot in common together from the world's perspective, 
But because of Jesus and what he has done in each one of us and his spirit within us, there's a unity and a bond that brings glory to him and extends into the kingdom. Do you lack those relationships? Pray and ask the Lord. He can bring them and he can change you too if some work needs to be done first to attract them. Do you see those people who are without anyone? Reach out, be a friend. And drum roll, please. We finish the letter to the Ephesians in verses 23 and 24. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. With all that Paul has expressed in this letter about the riches of God, about what Christ has done, about all that is valuable to us now and awaits us in the future as his children, look at these concluding thoughts here. Peace, love, faith, grace, amen. We have peace with God because of what Jesus did by dying to forgive us on the cross. His love, it's shown to us by being the substitutionary sacrifice because God so loved the world. Faith, faith to believe that we are justified by what he has done and not what we can do. And grace, his undeserved, unearned favor for salvation and for this day-to-day life that we need. May God grant you peace in a world that often robs us of it, a peace that surpasses your understanding, a peace that the world cannot give, a peace that guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. May you increase and abound in love for the Lord and for the lost and for his word and for one another, a love that does not come from natural affection or inclination, but a love that comes as a fruit of the Holy Spirit, his agape love within us. We love because he first loved us. May you walk by faith and not by sight, with a faith that is purified as it is tested and grow stronger as the day of his return approaches. May you grow strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and may your relationship with him always be born out of grace. And may you extend his grace in all that you do and say and live. And may your spirit testify with amen, confident and secure that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, that we can be confident in him and that every promise is faithful and true and that Jesus will have the final word, so be it, amen. Well, we made it. Season one of the Verbatim Word podcast. Thanks for being a part of it. Don't worry, season two is just around the corner and I look forward to seeing what the next year looks like as we find biblical truth in a daily context. Because I'm telling you, if the last year is any indication of it, we're gonna need his word and his truth to make it through another year. Until season two, God bless you.